It's a powerful story. Both the miracle performed by the disciples and the testimony they give. But often when we come across this passage, we overlook the story and jump right to the most quoted and often debated verse. Verse 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. It's a controversial um, statement in our pluralistic society, which would insist that all ways lead to God. When many people read this verse, they hear it as a means of drawing lines to determine who's in heaven and who is not. Is that really what this verse intends to do? Before we get to that, let's back up to the start of the chapter so we may encounter the statement in the same way Peter's audience did. Because in the first century, that actually was not the most controversial statement they made. In the first century, the more controversial statement was whether you believe in the resurrection. Not whether you take a more conservative or more liberal view of the resurrection, but whether you believe in the resurrection at all. That in itself was a pretty radical and dangerous view. It was seen as an attack on the status quo, a threat to any existing power structures. For to believe in the resurrection meant to believe that one day God was going to set the record straight. To restore all things. To turn an upside down world right back on its right side. Those in power were right to be suspicious. As they couldn't guarantee they would get reelected in this new world order. So when Peter and John came along proclaiming not just that Jesus had been resurrected to them, but that in Jesus, the resurrection of the dead was possible. That signaled them that these two rebel rousers believed that they, like the Blues brothers, were on a mission from God to overturn the world as they knew it, starting with the religious authorities. For Luke to tell, tell us these religious leaders were much annoyed with the understatement of the century. They weren't just annoyed, they were ticked off. So they arrested Peter and John, and the next day hauled them into court to question them. By what power, by what name did you do this? They asked. There are two things going on here. In the context of the first century, the temple leaders thought they were the only authorities. So if someone did anything they didn't especially authorize, that meant someone would soon find themselves on a one-way express train to prison, if not death. But in the context of the first century or the 21st century, any century, the question is, as also a pretty standard legal legal maneuver to attempt to trap the accused in his own words by provoking an answer that is self-condemning. And Peter willingly complied. Rather than dodging the question, he answered them straightforwardly, even maybe a bit sarcastically. After all, what was his crime? Healing someone who was sick? No good deed goes unpunished, right? (laughs) But Peter goes on to say much more than that. If we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man was healed, let it be known to all of you that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ. It's in that context and the heels of this healing and statement of the source of healing. And we get that statement that some would argue is exclusive, but I would say is gracefully inclusive. There is salvation in no one else. 
For there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be, be saved. And after that, all the rulers and elders and scribes are amazed and could see nothing in op opposition. If we were to make that same claim today before a crowd, there'd be plenty of people who would have a lot to say in opposition. Why this statement, which is so contested in our day, seem to have, to have no context in Peter and John's day? Because it wasn't what they heard that was most shocking. It was what they saw. They saw their boldness. A boldness that was quite unexpected for two ordinary people. A boldness that came from believing in the resurrection and therefore knowing what the final chapter holds. In ancient Chinese theater, there were two stages, one above the other. On the lower stage, one group of actors performed a play scene by scene, act by act. While on the upper stage, another group of actors rehearsed in fi the final scene over and over and over again. So all throughout the drama on the lower stage, the good days and the bad days, the scene when everything was going according to plan, and the scenes when it seemed evil would have the final say. All throughout that drama, the audience was reminded of the ultimate victory that awaited in the last scene. That's a scene we see when we look at our risen Savior. What would you do today if you knew you couldn't fail? Because ultimately, you can't. Now let me add a word of caution on that. Knowing that God is for us and that ultimately we cannot fail because God's going to defeat our enemies, that can give us a boldness in the form of arrogance. There have been plenty of times when people have used the good news of the gospel not to promote God's agenda, but to promote their own agenda. In the time of the Crusades, for example, when people read Jesus' parable of the great banquet, how the master told the servant to compel people to come in. They believed that gave them the right to use threats, coercion, violence, and other compelling acts. But Peter and John believe that true courage and, and conviction is demonstrated best through humility. Notice that they corrected their opponents without condemning them. None of their testimony was stated in terms of who's right and who's wrong. They simply told what Jesus had done. Even when faced with whether or not it was right to listen to their accuser or to God, they still didn't judge. Instead, they said, we can't help but speak about what we have seen and heard. Peter and John recognize that boldness and arrogance, while they may further our human agenda, they are not part of God's agenda. But when they combine boldness with humility, that's when these ordinary disciples became extraordinary witnesses. We can learn a thing or two from that, can't we? Because when we're honest with ourselves, we admit that the arrogance and agendas that have plagued our history run just as rampant today. When we as Christians are, are known more for what we are against than what we are for. Friends, it's time we change our reputation. It's time we define ourselves not in terms of what separates us, but what draws us in together. It's time we speak more of what we are for and what we are against. For if God is for us, then how can we be against God's people? If we are, then you and I don't fully yet understand the gospel. One of the best, most 
honest understanding of the gospel comes from pastor and author Timothy Keller. Keller writes, to affirm the gospel is to say, I am so bad that Jesus had to die for me and so loved that he was glad to die for me. Let me say that again. I am so bad that Jesus had to die for me and so loved that he was glad to die for me. For me. That's the gospel. The source of both of our confidence and humility when we recognize that we are in desperate need of a Savior. Thanks be to God. We have one who loves us all the way to the cross and back. The kind of confidence and humility, knowing that God is for us, is what leads us to be for others. Not, and not just be for them, but to be with them. Rather than sitting off on the sidelines saying, look what the world has come to. We are called to get in the game and say, look what has come to the world. And then looking for every opportunity to show this world what the world to come will look like. Maybe you and I won't ever cause a lame man to walk. Or who knows, maybe in the power of Jesus' name we, we will. Or maybe we'll do even greater things than that. In his book, Blue Luck Jazz, author Donald Miller t- tells the story of another ordinary man, his friend Andrew, who feeds the homeless every Saturday morning. Miller writes, all great Christian leaders are simple thinkers. They actually believe that when Jesus says you should feed the poor, he means you should do it directly. It's as simple and as profound as that. Because it's not the greatness of the act that gives the power, but the greatest, uh, gr- greatness of the name in which it's done. Whatever we do, whether it's helping the lame to walk or feeding the poor or, as Scripture says, simply giving a cup of cold water to a child. Any act can be a miracle. When we give what we can, as often as we can, to whomever we can can, in the name of Jesus Christ. Because we know what it is to be in need and to have needs, our needs met by the Savior. And we want others to hear the same. Go back to the infant statement in verse 12 and we'll find that's exactly what Peter was saying. When we think of salvation, we also think about what happens when we die and who's going to heaven. But as scripture tells us, Salvation has as much to do with our living as it does with our dying. It gets lost a bit in our English translation, but the original Greek helps us understand what salvation means for us today. The Greek word translated saved at the end of the verse can also be translated healed. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be healed. It speaks to God's desire for us. Not only to experience salvation for eternity, but to experience that healing even now. God is working even now. What does it mean to say there's no other name? It means there's no other name that can heal us on both sides of the grave, like Jesus can. No other name can heal our past. No other name can give us hope for our future. And no other name can set us free to live that future today. Because once we have found the source of a cure, we cannot help but speak of what we have seen and heard. When the religious leaders saw and heard all this, they said, it is obvious to all that notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. 
people may deny the name of Jesus, but they cannot deny a life lived confidently and humbly in that name. See, Peter and John knew that the resurrection meant God was beginning to restore all things. That's what that final scene of restoration would look, look like. So why cut off until tomorrow what we can experience today? Rather than sitting on their laurels waiting for it, they look for opportunities to bring that future world into the present world. If God is for us, then we have nothing to fear. If God is for us, then we now have the freedom to be for and with others by being signposts of the reconciliation to come. What would people in your life say you believe based on what they see you do? Would they say we are for and with others who desire to heal and not hurt? If not, then maybe it's time we re-examine what we believe about, about the gospel. For as Don Miller said, said, he learned from his friend Andrew, what I believe is not what I say I believe. What I believe is what I do. Sisters and brothers, God is indeed in the process of turning this world upside down. May he begin by turning our lives upside down. That the way that we live in the world today might reflect the ways we will live for all eternity. Thanks be to God. Amen. Before we go into our moment of reflection, our closing hymn, when I was a Young Life volunteer on Young Life staff, we were always told in our Young Life talk, the bottom line question was, so what? And one of our very faithful church members said to me this week, I need a takeaway. So here's your takeaway. I encourage you to meditate on two verses. The first was Acts 3, chapter, six, Acts chapter 3, verse 6. There... I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. And as we often say during our offering, some of us do not have financial means to give anything. But we have something to give. On one of the times when James and I went to Kenya, um, I was staying at the um, children's home, and the children's director said, before we walked to worship, she said, don't forget to tell everyone to bring some money for the offering because everyone comes forward during the offering. So I stuck a $20 bill in my Bible. It was about a mile walk to the church. And somewhere along the way, I lost my $20 bill. And during worship, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, what I, everyone comes forward. What do I do? What do I do? And I noticed everyone did come forward, but some came forward with money. Some came forward singing songs. Some came forward just praying. And so I came forward and I prayed, whoever got that $20 bill, let them use it for good. In the second verse, I invite us to meditate on. What will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. What notable sign are you going to do today in the name of Jesus?